What's up, everybody? Hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, writer, and historian. It is Sunday, August 20th, 2023, the 403rd commemoration of August 20th, 1619, when 29 Africans came into uh, Virginia at Point Comfort on that White Lion pirate ship which was a Dutch pirate ship. I'm here with our esteemed uh, friend and educator, Dr. Chike Okua. How you doing today, brother? I'm blessed, brother. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right, man. Well, this is a timely conversation. Um, everybody, today we're going to talk about what Black people need to know about the Florida school curriculum culture wars and these school curriculum culture wars are spreading across the nation and specifically we're going to talk about a washington post column that dr chike akua wrote uh came out uh august 17th which is marcus garvey's birthday as well august 17th 2023 and uh, uh chike sent me a text message of the uh article uh, yesterday, I said, hey, we have to interview you on the African History Network show today. OK, so uh, let me just do a brief introduction of uh, Dr. Uh, Chike Akua. He's an assistant professor of educational leadership at Clark Atlanta University and one of the most sought after speakers in co at colleges, universities and educational conferences. As an internationally recognized thought leader, Dr. Akua's scholarly research on African-centered education has been published by academic presses in the following publications, African-Centered Education, Theory and Practice in the Year 2020, The Journal of Black Studies in 2020, The SAGE Sage Encyclopedia of African Cultural Heritage in North America in 2016, and The Handbook of Urban Education in 2014. His most recent book, is the revised and expanded fourth edition of honoring our ancestral obligations seven steps to black student success which is used as a text at a number of colleges and universities nationally and uh, he's the author of 11 books and creator of reading revolution online which he'll give us more information about later in this uh interview and their website is readingrevolution.org readingrevolution.org all right so um Brother, uh, we're going to pull up your article here uh, from the Washington Post up here on the um, uh, screen chat uh, on the screen share. But the name of the article is The Irony of Black History Legislation in Florida. So give us a synopsis of what you were talking about here in this article. Sure. Uh, I went into some of my research on black history laws throughout the country. And in some of my research, I examined um, black history laws in several states, New York, New Jersey, Illinois, South Carolina, and Florida. And interestingly enough, I found that Florida had a little known African American history law. And I found that their law was the most comprehensive of all of the different black history laws that I examined. Right. And what made it, um, what made it unique was that this is the only law that required that teachers teach the African and African-American contributions and accomplishments that have been made across the curriculum. So in other words, in those other states, the law required that teachers teach um, about slavery and the African-American experience starting in America mm -hmm. and only in the social studies classroom. But Florida's law was more comprehensive because it required that you also taught the African contributions before slavery and right. across the curriculum, meaning in science, in math, in language arts and reading and literature and social studies, all of the different subject areas. So I found that to be a fascinating article and that the, uh, the people who brought that legislation into being were very intentional about how they worded it. So I right. found it very ironic in terms of what's going on in Florida and many other states now, as they're trying to, to censure uh, what's taught about black history. And much of that is happening or started in Florida, which has interestingly enough, the most comprehensive law. So that's what we mean by the irony 
behind these black history laws. Okay, and that law that you are referring to is Florida Statute 1003.42, Section 8, and is referenced here in your uh, article here for the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this section, and I'm going to have you elaborate on this, you talk about the fact that um, in so you were teaching um, in at a school, was that an elementary school or middle school and that started in 1992 in Virginia? Yes, a uh, middle school. Middle school. OK. And you go on to say in 1994, two years after I began teaching in Virginia, the state of Florida passed landmark legislation that required the teaching of African and African-American contributions across the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And everybody could research this. And he put the link here in the article. Uh, to this statute. I think it has the link to the article, uh, the link to the statute, or you can Google it. Florida yeah. Statute 1003.42 Section H required that teachers teach, quote, the history of African Americans, including the history of African peoples before the political conflicts that led to the development of slavery, the passage to America, the enslavement experience, abolition, and the contributions of African-American society, okay? So mm -hmm. now contrast that, now you, 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 and we're gonna talk about your experience of teaching in Virginia as well, mm -hmm. but contrast this law and Governor Ron DeSantis, who I loathe and abhor, he has cited this law uh, to try to give cover to the 2023 social study standards that so many people are raising objection to. And I have those social study standards. I'm gonna show them on the screen as well. I have the PDF of it, of the 216 page document or so. Uh, talk about how this law contrasts with the 2023 social study standards. Well, the law that came out in 1994, as you can see, is very comprehensive in the way that it was worded because it was uh, it was constructed by black scholars and educators and legislators. Okay? Right. And I interviewed several of the black legislators and educators that brought that law into being. And what they were very clear on is that prior to that law, uh, there were several themes that emerged. One of them is an inaccuracy in the school curriculum. That right. each of the people that I interviewed were very, very clear that school curricula to that point was very inaccurate. Mm -hmm. Secondly, not only was it inaccurate, the second theme that emerged was that there were clear omissions um, that were very important contributions and accomplishments that African people and African Americans had made to, hum to American history and to human history. The, the third... Uh, element or theme that emerged in these uh, in these interviews. And by the way, when you conduct research, you're looking for patterns. So these are the patterns right. that emerge, whether you're doing interviews, doing surveys, observations. So the third uh, thing that emerged was this issue of correction, that that the the standard American narrative of history needed to be corrected of these inaccuracies and omissions. And then once corrected, uh, the true and authentic contributions of African-Americans and Africans needed to be included into the curriculum. So inaccuracy, omission, correction, and inclusion. Those were the four primary uh, elements um, that emerged in my research. So now when you contrast that with the so-called Stop Woke Act, right? one of, one of the things that, that came up uh, in DeSantis's um, remarks that was very ignorant was that he suggested, and you just scroll past it, was that enslaved Africans developed skills as a result of slavery. Right, uh, exactly. Uh, you and know, I've dealt with that extensively here on the African History Network show, but 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 go ahead, because yeah. you do have some historical information here as well, but go ahead and talk about that. Right, so we know, and historical research tells us that African people brought the knowledge of, uh, of the cultivation of the cash crops that made America a world superpower uh, virtually overnight. So they brought the knowledge agri of agricultural engineering as it related to 
cotton cultivation, indigo, right. tobacco, rice, sugar, rice, rice, all of those. And I wish <laughs> I had added rice in there. I forgot to add rice. Yes. Absolutely. These are the cash crops that made America a world superpower uh, almost overnight. Remember, when Europeans first came to America, they were starving. Right. They didn't know how to plant crops. It was right. the indigenous people um, who had to show them how to how to do that. And indeed, Africans brought that over. They studied us very carefully so that they would know which nations to invade and which Africans to bring over here who had specific skills. So for him to make that very ignorant remark to suggest that Africans uh, benefited from enslavement is idiotic and is very ill-informed and is very dangerous to teach our children or any children that. Because what it does is it justifies abuse. It very subtly justifies white terrorism and says, well, hey, you all should just be thankful to be here because you're in America, exactly. you're the greatest nation in the world. Well, America would be nothing to speak of were it not for the brains and backs of African people. Exactly. And, you know, j just a couple things. And I know you know this because you teach about the history of the Moors. Uh, the Moors introduced into Europe cotton and sugar about ninth and 10th century. Mm -hmm. OK, so we and, and sugar comes from sugar cane. OK, sugar cane grows in hotter climates. So we knew how to grow sugar cane. And this is going to be one of the biggest cash crops, even before cotton becomes king for Europeans. You know, when you study the, the Spanish colonies, you study Christopher Columbus, they're setting up cotton. Uh, they're setting up sugar cane plantations in Cuba, uh, Jamaica, things like this, uh, Santo Domingo, which becomes Haiti, et cetera. So we taught that we saved Europe multiple times. OK, we taught them so much. We saved Europe and Europeans multiple times. Um, well, here's, all right. here's the further irony about that. Uh, the further irony about that is I have been providing consulting to the Florida African-American History Task Force. It's actually the Commissioner of Education's uh, okay. African-American History Task Force. And I've been consulting with them since 2006. I've developed curriculum resources for them online uh, training and professional development and in-person professional development for teachers and leaders throughout the state of Florida. Um, they have utilized my books and, and, and all of the things that I produce. Well, the right. African-American History Task Force in Florida is very progressive and is very clear and aware of the things that you've shared because the things that you shared are actually in the curricula that I've produced for them. I've spoken at their summer institute several times. So they're aware of all of this, but they're being right. suppressed by the Florida Department of Education and by Governor Ron DeSantis. And so those that are listening right now will say, man, that's that's terrible, Dr. Kua. But hey, I don't live in Florida. Well, guess what? If your neighbor's house is on fire, guess what? You better grab a pail and some water and get to helping him or her put that fire out. Because guess what? It's not just in Florida. Florida Correct. is receiving most of the uh, most of the the uh, the heat for this. They're receiving most of the the play in the media about this. But in reality, there are 35 states who have proposed legislation similar to Florida. And of those 35, 16 have already passed a similar law. Mm -hmm. So you need to check your particular state. And there's certain things that we need to be doing as black people with our children uh, whether your child is going to a public or private school or charter school, there are certain things that we need to be doing as parents at home to inform and influence our children to understand the truth about their history, heritage, and culture. Excellent, excellent. And uh, so we're going to come to those things as well. You talk about them at the end of the article uh, also. There's some critical things that I want to hit on because I I've been reporting on this extensively here on the African History Network show, what's going on with Florida first, dealing with the um, um, advanced placement African-American studies curriculum, the class, which was banned by uh, Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida, but then also the social studies standards. And now Governor Ron DeSantis has said publicly that 
he had nothing to do with these social study standards. But there's a there's a um, there's a commission. There's a commission. And you have African-Americans on the commission. Uh, one of them is Dr. William Allen, who's a well-known African-American conservative. Uh, there was an article from uh, NBCNews.com from July 28th, 2023. And Dr. Greg Carr uh, alluded to this on, um, uh, it's another, not not on Roland Martin Unfiltered, but on another huh? the light table that he does. No, not his show. The other show. What's the sister's name? Karen. Oh, Karen Hunter. Karen Hunter mm -hmm. on Karen Hunter show because he read through the uh, social studies standards and he says it. It seems like there was a disagreement among those on the committee about the most controversial part. Right. So this article here uh, from NBCNews.com from July 28, 2023, is called "Most of Florida Work Group." did not agree with controversial parts of state's new standards for black history members say, quote, most of us did not want that language, end quote, one group member said. So it was two African-American PhDs who were the ones really from, from these reports and from what I read, who were really pushing that, that controversial standard. One was Dr. William Allen and another was an African-American woman who's a documentarian, uh, uh, Dr. Presley Rice, Dr. Francis Presley Rice, okay? And I want you to comment on this in just a second, but I, I just want to read this section here. The work group members who spoke to NBC News said that only two members of the work group, Dr. William Allen, who's a black conservative, he was on uh, Fox News on uh, Jesse Waters show. Jesse Waters is replacing the white supremacist Tucker Carlson on Fox News. Uh, Dr. William Allen and Dr. Francis Presley Rice, they advocated for the criticized language. Dr. William Allen and Dr. Uh, Francis, uh, Dr. Francis Presley Rice, both black Republicans, released a joint statement last week defending the new standards as quote, comprehensive and rigorous instruction of African-American history. Now, um, uh, and they go, they said, quote, the intent of this particular benchmark clarification is to show that, show that some slaves develop highly specialized trades from which they benefited, end quote, these two black PhDs wrote, quote, this is factual and well documented. Go ahead and respond, Dr. Chike Akua. Then I got some follow up. I got some follow up information on this as well. Yes, yeah, very skillful the way that they're attempting to word this. But let's go back to some of the first mm -hmm. words you used to contextualize this. And you said two black conservatives. Anytime I hear yep. the words black and conservative <laughs> together, we have to ask the question, what are you trying to conserve? Are you trying exactly. to conserve traditional African and African-American values, history and culture? Or are you trying to conserve the views and values of the white people who are paying you to say these things? And I think it's right. more of the latter, that certain of these so-called scholars are put in place because those that put them in place know that they will do whatever they're told to do. They're Correct. put in place because they already have a certain perspective that benefits whites in power rather than African-Americans whom they should be serving. So it's clear, once again, when you, when you read the literature, you begin to understand that African people already came here with highly specialized trades. We right. built America. It was built mm -hmm. on our brains and on our backs, not just our backs, but our brains, we brought the intellectual know-how of agricultural engineer, uh, of agricultural engineering, iron work, uh, architecture, all of the different things that allowed America to become a world superpower in a relatively short period of time. So when they say again that you know some enslaved Africans benefited from this, again, right. that is very slick language that would make the reader believe that we should just feel blessed to be here and that it absolves America of the white terrorism that our ancestors experienced and that we still experience to this day as a result of being black in America. So it's these kinds of things that, uh, first of all, teachers and leaders, uh, educational leaders are often not taught these fine distinctions. And teachers right. can't teach what they don't know. 
So exactly. even when the 1994 legislation was a law, most of the school districts in Florida were still out of compliance with the law because teachers mm -hmm. can't teach what they don't know. And many superintendents were not enforcing that law or making it a priority. It was not measured oftentimes on the state test. And most oftentimes it was not in teacher or principal evaluations. You weren't being evaluated on whether or not you were teaching these African and African-American history standards. So, um, so this is why what we call fidelity of implementation is so important. Once you have the right. law, have you actually implemented it according to the language and meaning of the law and those that wrote the law and what they intended? And we can say definitively that the answer to that is no. Absolutely. Uh, th this article here that I have up on the screen from uh, was from WashingtonPost.com, I've talked about it here on the African History Network show. I use it in, this is one of the numerous articles, 100 plus articles I use in my online classes. Now, this is from July 24, 2023. Note to Florida and DeSantis, enslaved Africans were already skilled. Now, this is by uh, Jillian Brockale, and it goes through and it talks about things that we've talked about before how a lot of these skills Africans brought to this country, how they came from highly sophisticated civilizations and, and kingdoms, et cetera. But it also um, talks about the fact that um, Europe, Europeans would target uh, different groups of Africans because they were known to have certain skills. Yeah. And they and they had the skills that these Europeans wanted. For for instance, for example, Chesapeake enslavers wanted people like the crew, uh, KRU, specifically for their skill for boat building. Mm -hmm. Though Europeans were sailing farther distances, slave traders marveled at the superior at the superior stability and speed of West African canoes, some of which they said could hold 100 people. These boat designs were idea for fishing, freight, and ferrying up and down the Chesapeake. Uh, she talked about, uh, we know Onesimus, uh, I'm, not exactly, uh, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce this, Onesimus, but Onesimus was the African slave who taught the Puritans how to inoculate themselves from smallpox. He was from West Africa. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, they talk about how New England Puritans targeted uh, a con speaking people from the Gold Coast or Ghana who had a long military tradition emphasizing discipline and quick thinking. But go ahead and comment on this, brother. Yeah. So and that's one of the things I love about your show, brother, is that you use documented research literature. And I can oh, give some you. other examples. If you go and you read Charles Finch's book, The Star of Deep Beginnings, the African Genesis mm -hmm. of Science and Technology, if you will go and read. Uh, Blacks and Science by Dr. Ivan Van Sertema. If you read right. Blacks and Science by Robin Walker, volumes one and two, mm -hmm. there is a literature on these things. We're not just talking and just making stuff up. When we say that there's scientific research literature, we mean that there is hard empirical evidence to demonstrate what we're talking about. There, you have it right, right there. It's Robin Walker, yeah. Blacks and Science. Yep. So, so there is a, a very long um, and extensive and voluminous research literature on these things for those that care to know. But right. one of the things that was done to us is to first of all, make it so that you don't know, and then mm -hmm. to make it so that you don't want to know. And so there's an right. African proverb that says, lack of knowledge is darker than the night. Not to, not to know is bad, but not to wish to know is worse. And so for right. those of us who do know, for those of us who have made this our life's work to study it and pass it on to our children, these are very, very uh, challenging times that we're living in. And what they are doing um, should be very clear to all of us. And so we cannot stand idly by and allow other people to control the curricula that our children will be fed when they go to school. And I want to say this also, uh, Brother Michael, um, okay. you know, we know here at African History Network how important independent black schools are, independent African right. centered schools are. And we will always advocate for that. In addition to that, however, we also know that 95, 96, probably 98, 99 percent of black children in America go to public schools. And they are going to be subject to this kind of indoctrination. 
And so that is why we must fight inside the system uh, and build outside of the system simultaneously. Exactly. And this is why, even, even though you and I are both advocates for homeschooling, and we both speak and have spoken numerous times at the Liberated Minds Black Homeschooling Education Expo, shout out to Queen Thais yes. and, and the people doing work there. But homeschooling by itself is not going to save African-American children. And what I mean by that is the majority of our children are still going to go to public school. So even though we can augment what's taking place in public school with homeschooling, we're not going to be able just to homeschool exclusively all of our children. Okay. And, the, and, and the other thing is that every ethnic group of children need this history also, not just African-American yeah. children. Go ahead. And in addition to that, our tax dollars are going to this. Exactly. So we're paying to be miseducated. We're paying yes. to be lied to. We're paying for what Dr. Kimmich Shockley uh, calls a mild form of mental molestation when our children yes. go to these schools. So we're literally paying to be oppressed. And one of the goals of the oppressor is to get the oppressed to participate in their own oppression. And mm -hmm. so that's one of the things that's that's a big problem with this as well. And this is why we must take a stand on this, why we must be vocal about it, and why we must continue to agitate to make sure that these clarifications and corrections are made. But we need to do it at home as well as in public and in the schools. Exactly. I, I want to go to this article here, then we're going to go back to your article with the, uh, from the Washington Post. Now, I, I've dealt with this all extensively here on the African History Network show, step by step. Um, so after the rebuttal from uh, Dr. William Allen and Dr. Uh, Francis Presley came out, um, what, what, what happened was uh, is is detailed here in this article here from the Tampa Bay Times picked up by Yahoo News. I want everybody to read this. Benefited from slavery. Critics say some of the state's examples were never even slaves. So this this is what happened. Um, to push back on the, the criticism that was taking place across the country, you had a spokesperson for the Department of Education named Alex uh, Lan Franconi. Alex Lan Franconi a spokesperson for the Department of uh, Florida Department of Education said the experts stand behind their examples. So they put out um, 16 examples of African-Americans who who they claim were slaves and who they said gained um, uh, skills during slavery that they could they were able to use to their benefit. OK. Responding to mounting criticism, the department, referring to the Florida Department of Education, issued a statement Thursday offering 16 examples of historic figures it said fit that description. OK, the description of uh, people were able to enslaved and gain uh, uh, suggesting some slaves benefited from skills they learned while enslaved that they develop highly specialized abilities that help them later in life is quote factual and well documented end quote the florida department of education stated asked for more information on friday florida's department of education cited references uh the colored patriots of the american revolution which is an 1895 book by William Cooper Nail. I don't know why they had to go back that far. And Encyclopedia of African-American History, 1619 to 1895, which is a 2006 book edited by Dr. Paul Finkelman. We had Dr. Paul Finkelman here on the African History Network show a few years ago when he was speaking at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African-American History. Now, Alex Lanfranconi, a spokesperson for the Florida Department of Education, said the experts stand behind their examples. Dr. Francis Presley Rice, a co-founder of the Yoakum African-American History Association and chairperson of the National Black Republican Association, already there, warning flags all, all over the place, National Black Republican Association, she's a chairperson, <laughs> provided the information to the Department of Florida Department of Education. But other sources, offer conflicting descriptions of the 16 historic figures and critics came forward to attack the department's claims. Among the problems 
historic sources show several of the 16 individuals were never even slaves. Go ahead and comment, and I'm going to pull up the 16 individuals, brother, because almost half of them were never slaves. Go ahead. Yeah, so there were many Africans who not only brought their skills with them from Africa, but there were many who uh, were free people in the Americas yes. who had developed their skills and were working uh, in everyday life. But, you know, we could shut this down with, with one simple comment, brother. Mm -hmm. And it's simply this. And I, it, I have to give a shout out to my brother, uh, Jr., who shared this with me. Um, OK. Would there be anyone so ignorant as to suggest that Jews benefited from the Holocaust? No. No, they wouldn't, you know. Even, even, so no, no one no, would, not, even, not, not Jews as a whole, no. No one no. would even think to say something mm. so outrageous. Right. But why is it that there are those that think that they can say that regarding African and African-American people? This is the right. question of power or lack thereof. And so, again, it seeks to justify uh, abuse and white terrorism. It, right. it, it subtly says, once again, y'all should just be glad to be here. You know, what if, what if, you know, look at Africa now. What if you were over there now? Well, if Africa hadn't been invaded exactly. and, you know, in the ways that it was, if African people were not brought here, there would be no America worth coming to because yeah. we were the ones that built it into something that was appealing and attractive to make people want to come here. But right, again, right. these are the it, fine distinctions that leaders and teachers have to have when they're teaching these different standards. Exactly. And, and, and not only that, we take it back to Dr. David M. Hotel and the first Americans were Africans documented evidence. There's overwhelming evidence to show the African presence here tens of thousands of years ago, at least uh, 51,700 years ago. So this, to be, to, be, to be quite honest, this was our land stolen from us, Absolutely. okay? You know, so so people have to understand that as well. Um, it, so people go through and read this rest of this article, and we're gonna go back to your piece here in just a minute. They go through and give examples uh, and, and this is what's so disturbing that, that these people now the two. So you, if you listen to Governor Ron DeSantis, he says, well, these standards were put together by two PhDs. These are the people. These are the two PhDs he's talking about. And one of the examples they gave was Booker T. Washington, who uh, is included on the state of Florida uh, Department of Education website as an educator. Booker T. Washington was enslaved, but did not gain his skills until after he was freed at age nine. He worked in mines and as a houseboy before entering school, according to Tuskegee University, which he found in 1881. They also talked about, they also gave, these two PhDs gave the examples of James Fortin and Lewis Latimer. And they said that they were slaves who gained their skills during slavery, okay? The department, the Florida Department of Education said Lewis Latimer was a blacksmith. Lewis Latimer that uh, helped, uh, dealt with the uh, filament when it comes to the light bulb. Mm -hmm. Things like this, the inventor, Lewis Latimer. Right. Okay. The department said Latimer was a blacksmith born into slavery in 1848 and freed in 1852. And James Fortin, the, the, the ship magnet, uh, was a, a, a shoemaker born into slavery in 1766 who escaped in 1788. A museum dedicated to Lewis Latimer states that he was born to two self liberated, formerly enslaved parents. He was self-educated. He worked as an, an inventor participating in the de development of the telephone and incandescent lighting, among other inventions. And then the Museum of the American Revolution describes James Fortin as a black entrepreneur born to free black parents. He served on privateer, privateer ships during the Revolutionary War and became a wealthy sailmaker. So about half of their examples that they gave to justify saying that you had some African Americans who, who were slaves and gained skills during slavery that they could use to their benefit later in life. Half of them were never slaves. Uh, go ahead. And we're going to go back to your article. So, so you're doing what I do as, as a professor who oversees dissertation research. When I look okay. through the draft of a dissertation of one of my students who's conducting research, I'm looking to make sure that their explanations are in alignment and whether uh, it flows with the proper logic. And just as you've yeah. demonstrated and the writer of this article has demonstrated, 
their logic does not flow logically. It is illogical. Exactly. It's very clear. So if, if I were uh, grading this paper or do helping this student to do revisions, I say, hey, you have to go back and you have to revise this because this is not in alignment. It's not in alignment mm -hmm. with historical fact. Go back and look at your literature review of the research. Go back and look at the data that you gathered and see if your data was authentic. So the, the writer of this article and, and what you have done, you guys are, are spot on because you're pointing yes. out the inaccuracies in what's being placed before us as something that's supposed to be accurate when in fact it is not. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, brother. You do a fantastic job as well. The article goes on to mention Henry Blair, who, who was an inventor also, and Paul Cuffey, who had the Back to Africa movement before Marcus Garvey. Mm -hmm. Paul Cuffey was taking uh, uh, African-Americans uh, to Sierra Leone. He was born free also. OK, Cuffey was born to, in, in 1759 to an emancipated slave. Uh, so people read the rest of this article uh, is, is from the originally from the Tampa Bay Times by Jeffrey S. Solichet, S-L-O, S-L-O, uh, S-O-L-O-C-H-E-K. Tampa Bay Times, picked up by Yahoo News. Benefited from slavery, uh, critics say some of the state's examples were never even slaves. This is from July 22nd, 2023. This is why it's important to do research and don't just, you know, uh, circulate nonsense like Tyler Perry bought BET, which I told people did not happen. I told people two months ago, I put out a video two months ago, I said Tyler Perry did not buy BET. Okay, let's go back to your article here. Now, uh, I want you to talk about, uh, I, I made note of some of the comments that you made. And uh, once again, everybody read this piece here from the Washington Post. Also see if Yahoo News picked it up. It's called The Irony of Black History Legislation in Florida. It's from August 17th, 2023, which is also the birth date of Marcus Mosiah Garvey. Uh, this is in the column Perspective by Valerie Strauss. And it's written by our guest, uh, Dr. Chike Akua. OK, so uh, you talk about um, teaching in middle school and you talk about um, teaching, uh, how you put it, you incorporated outside information dealing with uh, African history, African-American history. And uh, you said that uh, oftentimes the OK, you said um, you incorporated cultural examples of excellence, resistance and self-determination. But a lot of times and I want to get your exact quote here. A lot of times those examples conflicted with uh, the administration or may have conflicted with uh, other uh, other teachers. OK, right. talk talk about some of what you were introducing that was factual but that conflicted with the administration or other teachers. You get an example also about a post of our posters. They wanted you to take down about black history, things of this nature. Sure. So back then, um, well, first of all, I was like to say that the teacher's store didn't have what I was looking for. Explain to people what a teacher's right. story is. My mother taught in Detroit yeah. public schools for 47 years, so I know exactly what the teacher's story is because right. I went numerous times when I was a kid. But explain to people who don't know what the teacher's story is. So a teacher's is. store is a place where teachers and educators go to find uh, posters and bulletin board material and anything that it relates to arts and crafts and, and things that you would do in the classroom with students. And, and I could never find the posters and things that I was looking for in the teacher's store so I would create them. I would right. I would blow up pictures and images. I would get them laminated and and in making these different things, I wouldn't just make them for myself. I would make them for my other teacher friends who were of the same mindset. And so some of you all may recall my, my friend Tony Browder, who is his book from the Browder Files. He has this yep. amazing picture of of an of a, of a muscular African man with arms outstretched with a comedic or Egyptian headdress on and mm -hmm. a silhouette of Africa behind him. Beneath that picture is the same man with his head bowed and his wrists in chains with a silhouette right. of America behind him. So right. I thought, man, that, that, 
that that image is so strong and it tells a story that my students need to know. So I blew it up and then I had it laminated and made several for some of my other friends. We were told by administration to take it down. Now, contrary to what you may think based on my energy right now, brother, back then I was not as as forthright and, and forceful and articulate in representing what I was doing and why I was doing it. But right. I couldn't just take it down. So what I did was I took my scissors. Well, I asked them, what's the problem with the poster? Said, mm -hmm. Is it the top part of the top or the part of the bottom? They said, it's the part at the bottom. I said, but that's historically accurate. Yeah, but that could, right. that could make students feel a certain kind of way and everything. We just want you to take it down. So instead of just taking down the whole poster, I took my scissors and I cut a jagged line, a jagged edge, cutting the bottom portion off. So when my students came to class, they were like, oh, my gosh, Mr. Cool, what happened to your poster? Who did that? I said, I did it. They said, well, why would you do that? Why would you cut up your poster? I said, well, we were told to take it down because there's some people who don't want you to know this story. Right. So I had to in, in my 14 years as a public school teacher, I had to covertly infuse this type of cultural knowledge into the schools because I found myself in the principal's office more often than some of my troubled students, myself, exactly. and some of my colleagues. And, and those of my colleagues that were doing this as well are doing amazing things today as well. But we were making a tremendous impact on our students but we're having to do it covertly and constantly under attack, constantly having to justify why we were teaching, what we were teaching and why we weren't just teaching the standards that they gave us to teach, but we were getting results that they couldn't get. Exactly, and, and you mentioned that here in, in the article and uh, Tony Brown is a friend of mine. We just had Tony on the African History Network show mm -hmm. uh, April 23rd, dealing with uh, why now Valley civilization history uh, is important. And I use two of Tony's books in uh, my classes, uh, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization and uh, Egypt on the Potomac. Mm -hmm. uh, those are two books that we use uh, by Tony Browder in my online history classes. Uh, so you in, in this section here in your piece from the Washington Post, you talk about uh, you had a poster of a black man with the headdress of a king and arms powerfully outstretched with a silhouette of Africa behind him. Beneath it was a picture of the same man with head bowed and hands shackled with the silhouette of America behind him. The poster provided an opportunity for deep examination and inquiry. The poster told a story that our administrators were unwilling to acknowledge. It is a story that many are still unwilling to acknowledge or accurately access uh, assess accurately assess today. Now, uh, you said it was not uncommon for one of us to be called to the office, the principal's office, for questioning about our methods and materials. But as a result of our methods and materials, we were achieving academic and behavioral results that other teachers were not achieving and often from students deemed unreachable. So talk about some of the success that you had with students who other teachers deemed unreachable, but what type of knowledge were you giving them that changed their behavior? Well, first, let me say, brother, and I'm sure you've heard this before. When you go on a job, mm -hmm. two of the most important people for you to know is not necessarily your direct supervisor or your boss. It is the right. secretaries and the custodians because right. they see things that other people don't. It was right. the secretary who let me know, hey, they're looking at your lesson plans real carefully. And I've heard them talking about you. <laughs> it was the black secretary who told me, listen, if you hear a click over the intercom system, a random right. click, they're listening in on your classroom. <laughs> I was like, yo, wow. So, but here I am. And, and I wasn't the only one. I want to be very clear. There are many conscious and committed black educators and, and non-black educators who are going through and have gone through what I'm talking about. But right. they used to send to me the students that they could not handle. They used to send to me the students that they could not control. 
Hmm. They were always amazed at, uh, they were oftentimes always amazed, you know, when they came to observe my classroom, my students were on task. They were, uh, they, they were answering questions, asking good questions, respectful, but then in other classrooms, they're unruly and out of control because they're not just unruly and out of control. That is a form of resistance to miseducation and oppression. This is what a lot of people don't understand. When our children act up and act out in school, it's not just acting up and acting out. It is a form of resistance to miseducation and oppression. And Mwali Mubaruti wow. says something interesting. He said, Shout out to Mwali Mubaruti. Mubaruti, yes. He said, Shout out to Mwali Mubaruti. Yeah, yes. He says, Miseducation leads to diseducation. I need to break this down, brother. Miseducation, okay. of course, comes from Carter G. Woodson, and that is uh, being given a form of schooling that doesn't teach you the truth about your history and culture or prepare you for life as you will face it. Okay, right. that's miseducation. But Mwali Mubaruti says, Miseducation leads to diseducation. Diseducation is an anti-learning psychology. In other words, you've lied to me so much, now I don't want to learn about nothing. So mm -hmm. think to yourself, have you ever seen, particularly young brothers, sometimes sisters, but most of the time young brothers who mentally opt out of school altogether. They checked out. They're, they're resistant. They're unruly. They're defiant. They're, they may be disrespectful because that is a result of diseducation. You've lied to me so much, now I don't wanna learn nothing. Right. And all of this can be mitigated and solved by conscious and competent educators who know the truth about our history and our culture and who understand the methods for reaching and teaching and bringing out the brilliance in black children. The methods for reaching and teaching Black children have been proven to be unique from other methods. And oftentimes, many of our teachers are taught in schools of education where they don't learn the methods that have been proven to bring out the brilliance in our children. Yeah. We already have a chronic teacher shortage. And then the teachers that do get results, you put the heat on them because they're mm -hmm. teaching in culturally relevant and responsive ways and they're teaching truths that you're not comfortable with. So this is what we're facing in the schools today. And it's something that needs to be dealt with head on. Exactly, I, I totally agree with you on that, man. Um, okay, and let me let me put your website up here, the website link. Everybody uh, visit uh, Dr. Chike Akua's uh, website, which is readingrevolution.org reading revolution we have it here at the bottom of the screen reading revolution.org you can uh get more information on his programming on his programs and uh get into contact with him as well and he's going to give us some information toward the end of this broadcast uh also uh so reading revolution.org check that out and for those just joining joining us, I'm Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. Uh, we're speaking with an esteemed educator, uh, Dr. Chike Akua, and he is also uh, an assistant professor of educational leadership at Clark Atlanta University uh, as well. If you like this type of information, uh, you can support the African History Network. Uh, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. When you go to our website, the African History Network.com, the African History Network.com, we have the information there. Uh, you can also register for the online history classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade on Saturdays, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and Sundays, Black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, the Black Power Movement, 1800 to 1968. And uh, Dr. Chike Akua, uh, let people know, and we're going to get back to your article, because I have some more questions for you if you if you have the time. I have some more questions for you, because I, I wrote out questions, too, and I went through your entire article, as I always do. I made notes, highlighted oh, things, et, et, et cetera. <laughs> Um, let people know about um, readingrevolution.org uh, for a few minutes, if you don't mind. Sure. So I'm, I'm always reminded of the words of Dr. Malana Karinga when he said, from a Black Studies perspective, you don't talk about 
you don't have a critique without a corrective. In other words, yes. you don't talk about a problem unless you have a solution. So we've been Correct. talking about the problem for some time, but throughout the entirety of my career, I have always developed my own curricula, fill yes. in the gaps of what I felt my students needed to know. And I didn't just do that for my students. We published those materials and those materials are circulating around the world now. The one that we're okay. most proud of um, that's being utilized in homes and in some school districts around the country and internationally is Reading Revolution Online. And what I like to, okay. I like to do, brother, is Go I would ahead. like to take everybody behind the scenes to see it. Because okay. when I was a reading specialist um, in the public school system, they sent all the students to me who would not pass the state test in reading. But they didn't have okay. a curriculum, which to me was great because I probably wasn't going to teach from in no way. I was going to create my own stuff because it probably wouldn't have met my need, my students' needs. So every day I would write up a brief reading selection about an African or African-American hero or shero, ancient or modern. And I would add 10 multiple choice questions to it uh, because I wanted the structure to mimic what they would experience on the state reading test. And so after okay. doing about 30 of those selections, uh, Spirit kind of whispered to me and said, hey, this, this needs to be a book. So I called on yes. another good friend of mine, uh, Brother Tavara Stevens, and we wrote the book, Reading Revolution. And that book did very well. It went national and international. It contains 90 of those reading selections, okay? But in okay. 2018, we began the process of digitizing all of that content so that we could make it available on an interactive platform. And so that's what I want to share with you right now. So let me know when okay. you can see my screen, brother. Okay. I just turned it on. Yeah, I can see it. Okay. So remember, there are 90 reading selections in Reading Revolution Online. For each of okay. the reading selections, there are four activities. Okay. So you can see me scrolling And, and if, you can, if you can zoom in on your screen a little bit. Okay. So people can uh, uh, read the lines okay if you if you want them to be able to read it. let me scroll down to the one i want to uh do we'll okay look at this one okay. okay is that a little bit better yeah that's a little better okay. yeah and you say control plus sign and that it will zoom in oh okay control control plus sign on your keyboard yeah that'll zoom in how's that there you go okay. yeah okay so we start off so remember there are 90 reading selections this one is about ahmed baba okay and yes. the purpose is to center our children in black excellence. We start off with yes. a power quote. This particular quote uh, is an African proverb, and it says, books are worth their weight in gold. Books are worth their weight in gold. So we want that on our children's mind as we get into the lesson. Then when you mm -hmm. go beneath that, and we would have a conversation on what that means and what their favorite book is and things. But then we go to what we call Boabad vocabulary. And you know, Brother Mike, um, in African tradition, the Boabab tree is called the tree of life because yes. the, the, the elders and the mothers of the city meet under the shade of the Boabab tree. Uh, the people hollow out the, the trunk of the Boabab tree to store water and food and other necessities. So it provides a number of things for the village, right? So yes. the Boabab tree is the tree of life. We call it Boabab vocabulary because doing these activities will bring life to our children's vocabulary development, reading comprehension, critical thinking still, uh, skills, and cultural competency. So these are the words that the student will encounter in the reading selection that we're going to go through, okay? As I scroll down, there is a captioned video to go with each reading selection. And the captioned video reads word for word what is in this reading selection. You can see the vocabulary words are underlined for easy identification, okay? Now, the reason we added a captioned video is because we know that our children are visual learners, and we wanted it to be a multimodal, multidimensional experience for them. Each, okay. each video is approximately three minutes, give or take a few seconds. This one is about three minutes, so I'm, I want to play this so that okay. those that are watching can get an idea of what they and their children will experience with Reading Revolution online. So bear with me for just a moment. And I make okay. captions on maybe about 30 minutes in. I'm, I'm sorry, about 30 seconds 
into it. Okay, just so that you can see, because you can. All right. And in uh, readingrevolution.org, once again, everybody, is Dr. Chike Akua's website that he's on right now that he's showing us, readingrevolution.org. Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. Ahmed Baba and the University of San Corre. From the 1300s to the 1700s, Timbuktu was one of the greatest cities in all of Africa. Situated near the Niger River, this great center of learning was known throughout the land. It was also an important trading center for gold, salt, iron, and books. Timbuktu had quite a reputation for educational excellence and wealth, so much so that students and scholars came from all over Africa, Asia, and Europe to study at the famed University of San Corre. Being near the river gave people easy access to this thriving city of trade and education and attracted many people. Ahmed Baba was the president of the University of San Corre for 30 years. During this time, he upheld the African standard of excellence, running the university with great vision. Also during this time, he authored 42 books. This means he wrote more than one book per year in addition to his duties as president. Additionally, Ahmed Baba had over 1,600 books that he owned in his personal library. This shows that he knew the power of books to transform the mind. To Africans who introduced the art of writing to the world, books were sacred and holy. Books were valued so much that people paid for books using only gold. The book a person desired to purchase would be placed on one side of a scale and gold dust would be sprinkled on the other side of the scale until the scales were balanced. Books in Timbuktu and in the empires of Mali and Songhai were literally worth their weight in gold. Because of this, the book industry was just as lucrative as the gold, salt, and iron industries. People who studied at Timbuktu learned law, medicine, and healing, writing, and literature, astronomy, the study of the stars, and agriculture, the study of farming, and much more. They took their knowledge and understanding of what they learned back to other parts of Africa, Asia, and Europe. Some even came to America. History also shows us that virtually every home in Timbuktu had an extensive library of books and manuscripts. Okay, before... All right, that's yeah. great. Yeah, that's fantastic. Go ahead. Before I go into the activity, brother, can you just tell me anything that stood out to you um, in watching that brief video clip? Just anything. Uh, well, I, I met Baba being the uh, president of the University of San Corre for 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew he had uh, uh, a library of 1,600 books. I knew he wrote uh, numerous books. He wrote 42 books. Uh, reminds me of the 42 laws of my, I, I mm -hmm. mean, uh, the 42 negative confessions of my. Right. Uh, but then also um, every every home in the city of Timbuktu mm -hmm. uh, in the Mali Empire had a library in the home as well and i and i tell people if people that watch the african history network show i tell them we need to have our own university of san Corre in our homes we have entertainment centers but we need to have learning centers in our homes as well absolutely and you know uh like so many people i was miseducated in in my k through 12 schooling process but when i started learning the truth um you know when i was growing up brother we used to say Man, I knock you all the way to Timbuktu. Right. <laughs> I didn't know that was an actual place, though. An actual right. place where people came from all over the world to study at the feet of our ancestors, right? Yes. So after listening to the video and reviewing the printed uh, uh, reading selection, the student would then go down here to the Boabab vocabulary activity. And what you see is the vocabulary word on the left-hand side, the definition on the right-hand side. So the duty of the student is this is a click and drag activity. So they okay. click and drag and, and bring the two together. So we know astronomy is the study of the stars. So we click and drag that 
and put those two together, right? We know agriculture right. is the study of farming. So we click and drag and put that in place, right? We know the word sacred means holy. And we put that together. After the student does all of these, they would then click at the bottom and the system would score that for them, okay? Okay. So for the 90 reading selections, there are four activities. Again, 90 reading selections, four activities for each one. The first activity is the vocabulary activity. The second activity is a comprehension assessment. And I'm going to just run through these real quick, and you'll see some of the vocabulary words in here as well. I'm going to get some okay. of them wrong on purpose for the sake of time. I'm just going to run through this. I'm going to get some of these wrong so that you can see how our system scores it. Okay. Uh, let's see. So, so this is what we call a short cycle assessment. That is a student reading a, a brief passage and then answering some questions about it. And again, I'm going to get some of them wrong intentionally just so that you can see how our system uh, scores it. All right. OK. And so I'm on number 10 here, let's see how we did. So we got an 80. So now you can see what you got wrong, what you got right and, and so forth. And so a parent can use this at home. If we know, see, we market my products to school districts all over the country and even internationally. But what I'm saying right. to black folk is we can't wait for school systems to get a clue. You exactly. see what's happening with these retrograde policies and laws where they are literally telling you, we want you to stay asleep. That's why we call it Stop Woke, right? Mm -hmm. yep. So we have to then take the responsibility to teach our children the truth at home so that at least when they go into school, they're not equipped to deal with the lies that they're being told. OK, so that was our multiple choice comprehension assessment. We had the vocabulary. We had the comprehension. Now we have the grammar. This is where we take uh, several items from the reading selection. And the student then has to retype each sentence, adding capitalization, punctuation, and changing verb tense where necessary. We don't have time for me to do all that now, but I'm just going to submit it. You see that I got a zero because I didn't complete it, right? This right. is going to improve our children's grammar and writing skills as they're focusing on these particular elements of grammar and so forth. And the whole idea of what I was trying to do here, brother, was really replicating my classroom and what I was doing with my students to be able to get the results that I got. I was able to take some students from F's to A's in language arts and reading and get wow. past the state test and so forth through these culturally relevant and responsive practices through these African-centered or Afrocentric teaching practices. But if we're gonna have a reading revolution, we also have to have a writing revolution. Right. And so for each of the 90 reading selections, we have a writing prompt also. This one says, Ahmed Baba wrote 42 books. If you were going to write a book, what would it be about? Would it be fiction or nonfiction? Who would the book be for? What age range or audience? Describe and explain. So the parent or the teacher would then tell the student, OK, I want you to write a paragraph. Or I want you to write two paragraphs about this particular writing prompt. And our platform will archive that writing for you for them, right? In right. addition, a parent or a teacher can track their child's progress across all of these activities, all of these reading selections. It's an amazing resource. Now, again, I'm just returning from Chicago from a school district just outside of Chicago who is implementing this program district-wide. They, okay. they get it. They understand the need for this. And there are many other uh, districts that are utilizing it. But again, parents, we can't wait for school districts to get a clue. If you have exactly your son, your daughter, your niece, your nephew, your, your grandson, your granddaughter. Right. We need to make all black people aware that this resource is available to make sure that they're centered in the best of their culture so that when they hear these erroneous remarks, of miseducation, they will know who they are, whose they are, where they come from, and where they're going. Again, it contains examples of African excellence uh, 
from ancient times to modern, right? Okay. Uh, so we wanted to give our children a very well-rounded example of what our excellence looks like. And then I want to show you something else real quick too, uh, brother. Okay. This, this may be just as important, okay? So now I'm going to the website. What I showed you before is behind the scenes once you get a Reading Revolution online membership. But I'm going to scroll down here and hopefully you can see this picture of the Reading Revolution team. Can you see that right there? We're all dressed yes. in blue. Yes. Um, and you said to blow that up, I can press, press control yeah, plus. Yeah, control plus sign, yes. There. Okay, so I want you to see them because that is actually my family, brother. Okay. This is a family affair. We we got together and we did this. You can see in the bottom left-hand corner is a picture of my wife. She is a master teacher in her own right. She did a number right. of the editing and the voiceovers. So when you listen to the videos, it won't just be a male voice. Sometimes you'll hear a female voice, right? Right above her is my oldest son, Jabari. Uh, he's a computer engineering and game design major. Uh, he did all of the, the, uh, the audio engineering for Reading Revolution Online. Next to him wow. is his younger brother, Amari. Amari is a film and media major. Amari did the videos, but when he saw the scope and the scales, he's an amazing photographer and videographer, but when he saw the scope and the scale of the project, he called upon his girlfriend, Ayana, who's in the bottom right-hand corner. She is an amazing communications major and an amazing uh, uh, video editor as well. So he got her assistance in putting together all of these 90 video clips. In the middle is my niece, Kaylee, who is also a STEM major. She did some of the voiceovers and some of the editing as well. So this is a, a family project that we are making available to our people all over the world. And I'm sharing that with people to let them know that we don't just talk about the problems. Right, we exactly. Solutions. And when you look at the results, look at what Dr. Marcus Jackson had to say here. He said, and he is the chief academic officer in Lancaster Independent School District in Texas, just outside of Dallas. He said, as okay. educators, our goal is to ignite a flame that burns for knowledge. For years, Reading Revolution has been able to ignite that flame for many of my students by improving reading levels by one to 2.5 grade levels in a year. In a year. Wow. Now, we know that our children were behind prior to the pandemic. Now right. there's even more learning loss. But he's saying Reading Revolution can help your child to improve their reading level in one to 2.5 grade levels in a year. Here we have a sister not too far from you in, in Inkster, just outside of mm -hmm. Detroit, Michigan. She was at Easter right. Prep, and her name is Latanya Stevens. She says, if you're considering Dr. Akua's Reading Revolution for your school or district, I highly recommend it. She said they were able to improve theirs an average of 1.7 years growth in reading in a year. Okay? Wow. And they said, so in other words, we're getting results. We have something that works, right? So exactly. for those that are listening, when you go to readingrevolution.org, I want you to click on parents. When you click on parents, that's going to take you to this page where you can watch a brief video clip and determine how you want uh, to engage with Reading Revolution. For those that are interested in purchasing a membership, you can okay. use this code to get a significant $200 discount, all right? Taking it from $497 to, to $297. And the code that you want to use is just READ in capital letters, R-E-A-D. So when you click on, when you click on to purchase, it will take you to a screen uh, that asks for the coupon code. And the coupon okay. code. Okay, I'm going to put that code on the screen yes. if you don't mind. Yes, READ okay, in capital code. letters. Okay. But when you think of the things that we spend money on for our children, $100 and $150 shoes, uh, dozens of video game um, cartridges and different things that they use to access video games um, where they're paying Jordan. 30, 40, <laughs> $50 per game and so forth. We have to invest in our children's education because they are showing us very clearly that they're not going to teach it except, right. except in places and spaces where they're conscious and committed black educators who are constantly advocating 
but still we have to do this at home. Exactly. And we really want to encourage and, everybody and, to use it. And and I've talked about uh on this show here the war against African American history being taught in the schools across the country across the country, especially in former Confederate states like Florida and oh, Georgia, yeah. things like this, especially these former Confederate states, because what's taking place is they want to suppress the teaching of the history of the past that teaches you how you got here. And then in those same states, they have passed voter suppression laws to suppress your ability to vote and have your vote counted, okay, to suppress your ability to impact the future. All right. So th th this is what's taking place. And this is this is a uh, and this is orchestrated. It's not a conspiracy because it's happening in plain sight. You can read about it. it it's not like so, some deep plot. No, it, you can read about this and to give, give you was one quick example. And then I want to um, wrap up with your uh, article from The Washington Post, because I do want to go back to that. Uh, so th this there's a, a a deep article from um nbcnews.com that deals with the origin of the anti-critical race theory uh movement okay and it talks about how it goes back to uh, uh donald trump in 2020 okay september 2020 uh, when he was president and an executive order that he did attacking um, uh, he was attacking uh, uh, it, it was in the uh, training that was taking place in, in the federal government. It was attacking um, a critical race theory and, and diversity, equity and inclusion uh, being uh, uh, that taking place in training with the federal government. I'm gonna pull up this exact article because I want everybody to read this. And it goes through and breaks this down. It's called uh, How Trump Ignited, let me get the exact article here, How Trump Ignited the Fight uh, Over Critical Race Theory in Schools. How Trump Ignited the Fight Over Critical Race Theory in Schools. Now, this also is an example, a new, one of the numerous examples of how elections have consequences and how you cannot let crazy people have power, okay? Uh, and this is something I was warning people about in 2016 about Donald Trump, and I was warning people what was gonna happen. And it was a whole lot worse than I thought, but I saw the I saw these things coming, okay? But a lot of people didn't understand history and didn't see this and didn't see this coming. Uh, how Trump ignited the fight over critical race theory in schools. Republican lawmakers across the country have proposed bills to ban critical race theory in K-12 schools. Here's what that really means. Now, critical race theory is a legal analysis that's taught in law school, graduate school, and a little bit at the undergraduate level. It's not taught in K-12, all right? But what they're doing is they're taking everything that they don't like about uh, teaching the history of slavery, African American history, things like this. They're putting it all this underneath an umbrella that they have redefined as critical race theory. It's not critical race theory. They have redefined it as critical race theory. And then they flooded Fox News with all these stories uh, because there's another 16 page analysis from NBC News that deals with the role that Fox News has played in this as well. But if you look at this uh, piece here, okay, the proposed policies mimic former President Donald Trump's September, is this, this was a September 2020 memo or executive order, uh, ordering the Office of Management and Budget to stop funding training on critical race theory for federal employees, calling it a, quote, propaganda effort, end quote, calling it a propaganda effort. Around the same time, September 2020, around the same time, Donald Trump condemned the 1619 Project, a Pulitzer Prize winning 2019 New York Times report led by reporter Nicole Hannah-Jones that holds America was truly founded not in 1776, but 1619 when the first enslaved people 
were brought to the colonies. Now, they, we, we've already talked about, we were here for tens of thousands of years before that. 16, August 20, 16, 19 did happen, but we, we have to understand this was our land stolen from us. Educators embraced this message and began utilizing the project and looking for resources to teach a more holistic history of the country. Donald Trump rebuked the 1619 project as a, quote, warped, distorted, end quote, portrayal of American history. Both the executive order he did, the memo, and this attack sparked the commission of the 1776 report, which Donald Trump ordered. The 1776 report, uh, he, he created this commission. And the 1776 report was meant to combat the contents of the 1619 project. The countrywide, the countrywide uprisings in the wake of the deaths of George Floyd, who was killed May 25th, 2020 in Minneapolis, Minnesota, only fueled the matter with pundits debating the nation's fraught history of racism. Thus, although President Joe Biden reversed Donald Trump's initial ban because Joe Biden uh, when he came into office, he dismantled the 1776 project and removed it from whitehouse.gov. Thus, although President Joe Biden reversed Trump's initial ban in January of um, uh, January of 2021, the seed had been planted. The seed had been planted. Go, go ahead, brother, and comment on this. No, it's, it's very, very clear uh, the efforts that are being taken to suppress the truth. The and we call this a manufactured crisis. Yes, this it is. It's a manufactured is. crisis around critical race theory. The fact that that CRT, critical race theory, is not taught in K through 12 schools. Right. It's a manufactured crisis to gain the attention, uh, to get more attention to to Republicans, to uh, to uh, increase their power base. Right. Yes. So this manufactured crisis is coming up against anything that critiques the standard American narrative of white supremacy. Correct. Anything that, that comes against that standard narrative of, of white supremacy ideology is going to be overshadowed by these different bands, by these policies and laws that are being passed. And that is why we need to wake up really quick and organize our people to understand these things. Uh, Carter G. Woodson said many, many years ago, there are two kinds of education, the kind you're given and the kind you must give yourself. The kind you're given right. is the kind that takes place in the public school system, which by the way, as Du Bois said in Black Reconstruction, that public education in the South was a Negro or Black idea. And guess what? Yes. In the Nile Valley, in ancient Kemet, we had free public education for males and females. When you go to West Africa and look at the great empires of West Africa, uh, Ghana, Mali, Songhoi, or Songhai, free public mm -hmm. education for males and females. When the Moors took over in, uh, in Andalusia, which is present-day Spain and Portugal, had an right. influence throughout all Europe for almost 800 years, one of the first things they set up was free public education for males and females. That's why it was very natural when we got to America and gained our emancipation, one of the first things that we did was build free public schools for males and females. Remember, white folk didn't even want education for all of their own people. Correct. For poor white people, they were like, y'all don't need no education. We just need y'all to keep these niggers in line. And you don't need mm -hmm. an education to do that. All you need is a whip and a gun. So it was black people who are responsible largely, not only for pre free public education, but also for males and females. Because remember, the females were being suppressed in Eurocentric society. But we had a, a sense of complementarity in our traditional African values. So exactly. we have an ancestral obligation to ensure that our children receive the best education possible. And we have to supplement even if you're sending your child to a private school, I promise you, most private schools don't have the type of curriculum that I just shared with you. So exactly. this is very important that we get on board. Uh, I totally agree with that. Um, one of the things you you mentioned here in this article is on page two. Uh, you said, I knew as a language arts teacher, there were many rich examples 
of reading, writing, language, and literature that developed in early Africa. There are many robust research-based examples to demonstrate this. For example, the teachings of Patahotep is regarded by some scholars as the oldest complete text in the world dating back more than 4,300 years ago. Talk a little bit about uh, the teachings of Patahotep and, and how you introduce this or how you use this to teach your students. Sure. So uh, the teachings of Patahotep was brought to our attention back in 1987 when it was published by Asa Hilliard, Nia Damali, mm -hmm. and uh, Baba Obadeli Williams. Um, Nia Damali, interestingly enough, owns Medu Bookstore in the city of Atlanta. And of course, yeah. Baba Asa Hilliard and Baba Obadeli Williams have transitioned to the ancestors. But the right. teachings of Patahotep contains 37 wise sayings. And Patahotep was the ancient scribe in the king's court who wrote the book when he was 110 years old. How do we know that? Because in the preface of the book, he says, I'm 110 years old, right? Right. In addition to that, it is a, 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 uh, a type of literature that we refer to as wisdom literature. Uh, the, the most familiar wisdom literature that our listeners are probably familiar with would be the book of Proverbs in the Bible, okay? Mm -hmm. But this predates the book of Proverbs by well over a thousand years, and you find many of the same sentiments in the teachings of Patahotep later show up in the book of Proverbs in the Bible. Right. So it's, it's a tremendous text that teaches young people our morals and our values and uh, um, principles of leadership and uh, issues of integrity and respect and so many just lifelong lessons that would serve our children so well. And again, not only do our children need to know this, all children need to know this. Exactly. Because when all children are not taught these things, I, I say in the article that every culture holds a key to unlocking the challenges that all humans must face. So when any culture is suppressed, all of humanity is diminished as a result of that. So when you hear right. me talking so passionately about what our children need, of course I'm B1, I'm black first, right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, And I also recognize that all people need to know this information. Other words, humanity is diminished. So the teachings of Patahotep is a, a powerful resource. You can go online right now and order that book. It's a thin book, a thin yes. book but a, a, a wealth of information in it that would serve you and your children very well. Absolutely. Uh, at the end of the article uh, from the Washington Post, uh, you give three recommendations. I, I have a copy of the teachings of Atah Hotep somewhere here mm -hmm. in the office, but uh, also in um, Dr. Malefic Ketia Asante's book, um, the Egyptian philosophers, mm -hmm. ancient African voices from Imhotep to Akhenaten. Yes. Uh, yeah, 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 that's it right there. I have that that version. But uh, he talks about Patahotep in here, who was a philosopher as well, lived somewhere around 2414 BCE before the Common Era. Because mm -hmm. uh, in the introduction, chronology of ancient world philosophers, they mentioned a number of different ones. Imhotep, uh, who, I, who I'm named after, uh, Kagimni, um, uh, um, you have uh, Kunanu, uh, Akhenaten, it's a number of them. Uh, Amenhotep, son of Hapu. So we this is before um, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Right. Okay. So <laughs> we have our own philosophers as well to study. Um, in the at the end of the article, and once again, everybody, the name of this piece from the Washington Post: the irony of Black history legislation in Florida. Uh, you say here are three recommendations for moving forward. Here are three recommendations for moving forward. Um, educate, let's see. So, and you mentioned Dr. Carter G. Woodson here as well. Let me uh, look at this last paragraph. Uh, you say effective and inclusive curricula uh, exists. Let's go back. Effective and inclusive curricula uh, exists, but are deeply suppressed, are deeply suppressed. In addition, curricular 
inaccuracies and omissions contribute to implicit bias and also prevent whites and others from accurately and critically examining their own individual and collective attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. Lack of knowledge about this nation's history is literally hazardous to the health of African Americans. As Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who's the father of Black History Month and co-founder of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, September 9th, 1915, uh, and he's the author of numerous books, including The Miseducation of the Negro, 1933, as he observed, quote, there would be no lynching if it did not start in the schoolroom, end quote. And, and also Dr. Woodson advocated for the history of African Americans to be taught in every school across the country, not just schools where we attended, because the way a people treat you is largely based upon what they think about you. What they think about you is largely based upon what they've been taught about you. And what they've been taught about you is what they read, heard, and seen about you. So uh, you take us through three recommendations. So what, what, are, what, are, what are those recommendations? And these recommendations, this is actually the work that I do in providing professional development to educational leaders and teachers and counselors across the country. Um, and so the first recommendation is to educate school leaders and teachers in the best of African-American culture, history, views, and values. And let me make this distinction. The reason I say the best of African and African-American history and culture is because okay. for many of our children, they've only been exposed to the worst of our history and culture. Okay. Because and it's what I call cultural identity theft. Cultural identity right. theft, how do you take a group of people who gave the world reading and writing and language and literature, and architecture and engineering and agriculture and astronomy, uh, mathematics and medicine, science and technology, how do you take that group of people and yet convince them that they come from a race of pimps, players, criminals, thugs, N words and B words, cultural yep. identity theft. Mm -hmm. So for conscious and committed educators, education is identity restoration. Education is identity restoration. But again, teachers can't teach what they don't know. So right. early on, and I've been doing professional development across the country for over 15 years, and I'll never forget, someone came up to me afterwards and they said, you know, Dr. Ku, I agree with everything that you said. We should be more culturally relevant and responsive in our teaching and everything. But I don't know as much about African and African-American history as you. And my response to that person and to all educators that I speak to is, no problem. You get to go on the journey with your students. The way that we've created Reading Revolution Online and all of the other materials that we offer from uh, from our Black History poster pack, our African Proverbs poster pack, and all of the various books we've produced. We wrote it in such a way that teachers and parents can go on the journey with their children. And so parents and teachers love reading Revolution Online as much as the children do because they're like, oh my gosh, I wasn't taught this when I was growing up. Right. So that first recommendation is to educate school leaders and teachers on the best of our culture, history, and views and values. The second is to infuse, now that you've learned it, infuse that authentic African and African-American culture and history into lessons, teaching methods, and instructional materials. So this is, this is a critical point. So if you're looking at this in your mind, highlight teaching methods, because the teaching methods is not just what you're teaching, is how you're teaching it. And there's certain right. methods that have been proven effective in working with black children. Call and response, um, bodily and kinesthetic movement, tactile activities where they get to use their hands, anything where they get to move around and talk, anytime you can use music and rhythm and rhyme. These are different teaching methods. There are many, but those are just a few examples of teaching methods that have been proven effective with black children that bring out the brilliance in our children. So you have to infuse authentic as opposed to inauthentic African right. and African American cultural and history lesson into lessons, teaching methods and instructional materials. And then our children are tremendously insightful and intelligent. 
But number three, we have to provide age appropriate opportunities for students to do their own fact finding and research using historically and culturally authentic resources. I'll give you a quick example of okay. kinds of conclusions that our children come to when they're given the opportunity to examine accurate information. I'll never forget with my seventh grade class a number of years ago, I was teaching about colonization. And I told my students, you can tell who colonized the land by the language the people speak. So in America, right. we speak, we primarily speak English and, and, and out West and in the Southwest, Spanish is spoken a lot. So we know America was primarily colonized by the British and, and the Spanish. If you go up to mm -hmm. Canada, we know that they speak English, but they also speak a lot of French. So we know it was colonized by the British and the French. When we go down to Mexico, uh, they speak Spanish. So we know it was colonized by the Spanish. Right. And one of my students, young brother, just blurted out, didn't even raise his hand. He was like, dang, Mr. Akua. I was like, what was up? He said, they stole countries and continents and nothing happened to them. But we get locked up if they think we stole a candy bar. Mm -hmm. I said, whoa. So then I asked the class, I said, man, say more about that. And then I asked him, I said, by a show of hands, how many of you have noticed that you've been followed when you go to the carryout store or the grocery store? Would you raise your hand? All the students' hands went up there, and then they started, you could hear them talking about, yeah, you know, when I go to the store, I noticed they're following me around to make sure I'm not, you know, stealing something and so forth. So then we had a conversation, well, why do you think that is? So right. we're characterized as criminals and thugs and, and, and thieves when in reality, the whole continent was stolen. The whole country was stolen, but we're the ones that are shown and portrayed as thieves. So this allows for a different level of critical engagement. And right. those that are against this kind of teaching are afraid that when our children wake up, they will demand all the rights and privileges that they are due as a result of, of the Bill of Rights and as a result of citizenship. And so part of the, the idea is to continue to indoctrinate them into the standard American narrative of white supremacy ideology and never have them to, to raise any question or any issues of inequity. And the best way to do that is to erase the history of inequity so that they can't talk about it. Right, exactly. exactly. And, it, and that goes back to the laws being um, passed in these, especially these former Confederate states. Um, they're using the lie of uh, uh, critical race theory they, they, uh, and, and saying critical race theory is indoctrination, is being taught in the schools, things like this is not being taught in the schools. That's a legal analysis uh, that's taught in graduate school, law schools, and a little bit in the undergraduate level. But they're using the lie, just like the big lie that the 2020 election was stolen, they're using the big lie to pass voter suppression laws to achieve their agenda. And they're using the lie of critical race theory to suppress the teaching of this history to achieve their agenda. But everybody should check out this article here. This is from thinkprogress.org. This is from March, uh, March 25th, 2015, um, how news outlets help convince you that most criminals are black. Mm. OK, so I have a background in media uh, and I've done extensive lectures and research on the impact the media has on the way we think, feel, act and behave. My degrees in marketing as well. The foundation of marketing is psychology. But this was a nationwide study uh, that looked at local. Uh, it looked at local, local news uh, stations, okay? And it, it found that the uh, local news stories that they covered dealing with um, a crime, okay, disproportionately showed African-Americans as the perpetrators, all right? And they looked at, um, in, in New York City, for instance, they looked at 
uh, WABC, WNBC, WCBS, they, they found that African-Americans were overrepresented uh, as suspects uh, in theft, assault, and murder coverage. And uh, they said on WABC, W uh, on WABC, WNBC, and there was one other one here. I'm trying to get rid of this ad. Um, WABC, WNBC, and WCBS, 82%, 73%, and 70% of all wrongdoers were African-Americans. However, data from 2010 to 2013 shows that black people only accounted for 55% of murders, 49% of assaults, and 55% of thefts in the city of New York City. So there, this goes back to what I was saying. The way you treat a people is largely based upon what you think about a people. What you think about a people is what you have 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 uh, well, have read, seen, and heard about a people, and what you've been shown about them. This is programmed. OK, so this is what we have to attack in deprogram. So this is why the, the work that you do, brother, is, is so important. Uh, go ahead once again and give people your website, how they can get in contact with you um, as well. Yes, please go to readingrevolution.org. Again, readingrevolution.org. You can click on parents and you can take advantage of the special that we have for everybody on the African History Network. If you desire to purchase a, a one-year membership to Reading Revolution online, once you click to buy uh, in the coupon code, you can just use the words READ, uh, the word READ in capital letters, R-E-A-D. Just type in R-E-A-D and you will get a significant $200 discount. But we want to encourage all of the parents to make this investment in yourself and your children, even if they go to a private school. Oh, okay. but our children need right. this. So readingrevolution.org. Um, if you're interested in bringing, to, bringing me uh, to your school or school district or to any function that you're putting on, your college or your university, you can go to drakua.net. That's D-R-A-K-U-A dot net. Again, D-R-A-K-U-A dot net. And you can look in the, uh, in the menu and it will say book Dr. Akua. You click there and you put in the specifications of the event that you would like for me to speak at. And it will send an automatic email to my assistant. And we'll see if we can get you on the calendar and make it happen. But we would love to come to your city, uh, to your school district, to your college or your university. In addition to that, even more than that, we want you to get Reading Revolution online. We want you to make it, take it up and let your child's principal and assistant principal and teacher know about Reading Revolution online and tell your neighbors and your children's friends, parents, and different things of that nature. Let's spread the word. All right. Excellent. Excellent, brother. Well, look, man, it's, it's uh, always good to talk to you. Thanks for coming on the African History Network show today. Uh, people visit this website and uh, take advantage of, of this. Use this information with your children. And uh, we'll talk to you next time, brother. Okay. Well, brother, I want to thank you for having me on. And I want everybody. Oh, yeah. No problem. I want everybody who's listening to know I'm not just a guest today. I'm a viewer yes. of the African History Network. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. I know, brother, you always do your research and you bring it. So I want to thank you for what you're doing. And I will always be a supporter of the wonderful work that you're doing. Oh, thanks, man. We, we appreciate uh, you and, and the continued support as well. And uh, sometimes we're at. Uh, the uh, Liberated Minds Black Homeschool and Education Expo together. We're, we're both, uh, we've both been speakers there numerous times uh, down in Atlanta. Third, uh, well, they changed. It used to be the third week in July. Uh, they, they changed it now. But uh, yeah, keep up the good work, brother, okay? All right. All yeah. right. All right. Peace. All right, everybody. This is Dr. Uh, Chike Akua. Uh, support this brother's work. Uh, people often say, you know, we need this, we need that. But then they don't understand that you have to support it. Otherwise, it's going to go the way of the dinosaurs. It's not, it's not going to exist. OK. All right. Now, if you like the type of information that was shared here today, I, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, and uh, register for the online history classes that I teach on uh, Saturdays and Sundays. Okay. Uh, Saturdays. And normally I would teach one today, but I said, uh, okay, we're going to uh, interview Dr. Chike Akua. 
Um, so next Sunday we'll be in class. But Saturdays, um, I teach a 12 week online course that I created uh, called Ancient Kemet, one of the original names for Egypt, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We had a fantastic session yesterday. We dealt with the Dogon and uh, how the Dogon originate in the Nile Valley region of Africa, the Dogon of Mali. We talked about Benjamin Banneker uh, and it's believed that Benjamin Banneker's uh, grandfather, uh, Banneke, um, was West African and possibly Dogon. Uh, we talked about astronomy, all of this, and the connection between the Dogon and ancient Kemet, the supreme being amongst the Dogon, uh, whose name is Ama, comes from Amen. Uh, we, and we know Amen, Amen Ra, Amen Ra Pata, the supreme uh, being in ancient Kemet. So we do this class Saturdays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's on sale, $80. It's a 12 week online course. This time around, we're going to do 13 or 14 uh, sessions. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded, so you can go back and watch it anytime. Okay. So as soon as you register for this 12 week online course, you can watch the class that we did yesterday and the previous weeks. And even after the 12 week online course is over with, you still have access to the full class. This content, I would say, is PG 13, it's not overly graphic or anything like that. We I do a PowerPoint presentation, we have book references, articles, video clips. We take you throughout history. We show some of the interviews I've done with some of some of our scholars, like Professor Kaba Kamane, Professor Jane Small, Tony Browder, Dr. David M. Hotep, and others. Sundays, I teach Black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement, 1800 to 1968. We go through history chronologically and look at look at this history. Uh, we look at what leads up to the Civil War taking place. We look at the Reconstruction era, Jim Crow era, uh, World War I, World War II, Civil Rights Movement, the Black Power Movement, to understand how we got to where we are today, to understand where we need to go from here. And I created both of these two uh, curriculums. Uh, we look at 80 to 100 articles in uh, each class. Uh, the book references as well. The first class is about seven or eight books that we reference. You don't have to buy any of the books. Uh, we show you excerpts of the uh, of the book right on the screen, okay? And I've, I'm a historian. I've been studying history 31 years. Um, and this these two courses that I teach is the culmination of a lot of research and interviews I've done uh, on the African History Network show. And I've been hosting the African History Network show. I created the show. I've been hosting for uh, 13 years as well, okay? So it, it, there's a PowerPoint presentation with over 200 slides in, in the first class that we use. I put together the PowerPoint presentation, put together the curriculum uh, also for both of these classes. And uh, we deal with thousands of years of history uh, and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Uh, we look at work from Dr. David M. Hotel, but we also talk about the 1619 Project. Now, today is August 20th, 2019, the 403rd uh, or 404th anniversary, I should say, of August 20th, 1619. Today's the 404th anniversary of that. Uh, when the, the um, White Lion uh, pirate ship, which is a Dutch pirate ship, as well as the treasurer come into uh, Virginia. And it was really Hampton, Virginia, as opposed to Jamestown, like people think. It comes into Point Comfort and 20 and odd Africans are exchanged for food and water. At this point in time, codified slave laws don't exist in any of the 13 colonies. The first of the 13 colonies that have codified slave laws was Massachusetts in 1641. They come to they come to uh, Virginia right about 1661 or so. OK. Um, and, and they don't hit all these colonies at the same time. These first 20 and odd Africans are put into a form of indentured servitude. They're going to be released after about three to five years to understand how. Now, this is an important article here that everybody should read um, is called. Uh, much of what we've been told about Virginia's 1619 Africans is wrong. Much of what we've been told about Virginia's 1619 Africans is wrong. And also, one of the books we use in the class is Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr. And chapter two, uh, uh, chapter two of this book 
he lays out how a lot of this stuff evolved here in this country okay the 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 colonies weren't originally designed to have slavery if they were they would have had slavery when it was originally set up because england originally got involved in the transatlantic slave trade in 1562 okay but what happens is that when you look at uh chattel slavery evolving that's going to largely be after uh 1675 and 1676 and what's known as bacon's rebellion and bacon's rebellion is going to really is going to be uh after 1675 1676 right about 1680 1681 where the term white becomes widely used in the colonies to denote those of european ancestry and what they were trying to do is break up the alliance between enslaved africans uh what we would call african americans or enslaved africans uh african indentured or free african people poor whites white indentured servants poor whites etc there was an alliance between these different groups because they were all being oppressed on the um tobacco plantations in virginia and they were being oppressed by the ruling elite and they realized that they had a common enemy so there was a rebellion that was led by a virginia tobacco uh, uh plantation owner named nathaniel bacon in 1675 in in the colony of virginia and in 1670 it is about 500 it's about 500 rebels okay in 1676 these rebels burned down the town of jamestown virginia okay how many people knew this in 1676 they burned down the town of jamestown virginia and i, I was speaking on a um uh i was speaking at the uh, midwest uh decarbonization conference in november 2022 and i was on the panel discussion with Native Americans and African Americans. And we were talking about, we were talking about a shared uh experience, but we were also dealing with um the fight for reparations for African Americans and the fight to get uh Native American treaties enforced. And you know, one of the problems is that when we to to really understand reparations and repairing the damage of a legacy of jim crow segregation slavery um redlining housing discrimination things like this you have to understand the laws and policies that were put in place that brought you to where you are that continue to inflict the harm okay to re reparations the root concept is to repair repair damage that was done we first have to analyze the damage that was done to African people, the laws and policies put in place. And as I say, as a historian of 31 years, as a student of Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Professor James Small, Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, we also have to analyze who African people were and what African people had before we were put into an institution of slavery to understand the damage that was done to understand that what has to actually be repaired just thinking giving cash payments is repairing the damage of a legacy of slavery no it's not because if we if if everybody watching this broadcast wants to be honest we know damn well if we all got a million dollars today white people will have it all back by this time next week and all the laws and policies that have now distributed wealth power resources will continue to be in place that continue to inflict the harm so cash payments can be part of a comprehensive repairing the damage of a legacy of slavery and jim crow segregation etc it can be part of comprehensive reparations but it cannot only be the form of reparations because once you spend the money you have not changed the you have not changed the laws and policies that continue to inflict the harm so to understand some of this history you i, I what i did was uh, during the panel discussion i i broke down briefly bacon's rebellion and so many people regardless of race don't understand this history okay so uh bacon's rebellion was triggered when a grab for native american lands was denied 
Um, and there's a, a piece at blackpass.org that talks about Bacon's Rebellion, but also King Philip's War, which was a, 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 a Native American uh, uprising as well. But the origins of Bacon's Rebellion rested with the conquest of the Powhatan Indian Confe uh, Confederation, 1644-1646, and the Confederation's lands being distributed to the English planter class, the English planter class. Despite their defeat, Indians formerly associated with the Confederation continued squatting on these lands, which caused the Virginia colonists to engage in warfare against them. Okay, now, we've, uh, the military and political situation was made more complicated by the presence of African slaves, who along with white indentured servants produced the colonies main crop which was tobacco this is before cotton becomes king cotton is, is largely going to become king after 1793 after uh the uh cotton gin is created by eli whitney which greatly reduces the cost to produce cotton before cotton was king in the colonies tobacco was king but also you're going to have sugarcane this this king as well but at this point in time tobacco was king OK, tobacco is the main cash crop. Now, planters looked down upon the African slaves, indentured servants and landless free landless freemen, both white and black, whom they called the giddy multitude, G-I-D-D-Y, -D -D the giddy multitude. So you had these different groups of oppressed people. You had uh, African slaves, you had indentured servants, you had what we would call free African-Americans, you had poor whites and you had white indentured servants. During the decades of the 1650s and 1660s, a sizable number of indentured servants, both black and white, both African and European, who had completed their required indentured labor service, clamored for old Powhatan land as well as well which was under the control of Governor Berkeley, who was the governor of the Virginia colony, and his planter class associates. Nathaniel Bacon, a wealthy white Virginia planter, declared himself the leader of the colony's former indentured servants, freemen, African and white, African and European, newly arrived landless white immigrants from England, Scotland, or Ireland and enslaved Africans, all of whom bonded together because of their common exploitation on the large tobacco estates in Virginia. All these different groups of people from different countries realized that they were all being oppressed by the same ruling class and they took up arms to overthrow the ruling class. Now on September 9th, 1676, Nathaniel Bacon and his followers returned to Jamestown, Virginia and battled forces uh, loyal to Governor Berkeley. He forced Governor Berkeley and his followers to retreat. And then Nathaniel Bacon and his 500 rebels burned down the town of Jamestown, Virginia. They burned down the town of Jamestown, Virginia. Now, I don't know if this was the inspiration for the song the roof the roof the roof is on fire we don't need no water let this burn i don't know if that was the inspiration for it but it very well could be okay i don't know that i, I don't know if that's a historical fact okay i but it could be who knows all right now <laughs> how many people remember that song okay now um let's go back to this here okay so there's a good article from uh, history.com official website of the history channel that deals with uh, uh bacon's rebellion as well and we reference a numerous sources here in the class uh toward the end of the 17th century labor from england began to diminish so what happens is the the economy in england improves and there's less of a desire of white people to come from england to be indentured servants here in the colonies so you have a drying up of the labor force, of the white labor force, okay? Toward the end of the 17th century, toward the end of the 1600s, um, labor from England began to diminish and the colonies were forced to, the colonies were forced with two, faced with two major dilemmas. The colonies were faced with two major dilemmas. The first dilemma 
was how to maintain control over the restless poor and the freedmen who seemed intent on the violent overthrow of the colonies and leaders because they were all being oppressed by the same ruling class, the same 1% or 10%, okay? The second dilemma that the colonists in control, the planter class, the rulers, the second dilemma that they were dealing with was how to obtain a controllable labor force as cheaply as possible. The colonial leaders found a solution to both problems. By the 1690s, they had divided the restless poor into categories reflecting their origins, homogenizing all Europeans into a quote unquote white category and instituting a system of permanent slavery or what we call chattel slavery. You were enslaved for perpetuity and your children are born in slavery and their children are born in slavery. So they create, so they use the term white widespread to put all Europeans into this one category and put them on team white, okay? And then they instituted a system of laws to institute permanent slavery for Africans, the most vulnerable, who, and the Africans were the most vulnerable members of the population, okay? Now, Encyclopedia Britannica, at Britannica.com, they have information on the history of the idea of race. This is where this citation comes from. The history of the idea of race. That's at Britannica.com, Encyclopedia Britannica. Okay, let's continue here. Uh, and then also there's an article from um, uh, history.com, official website of the History Channel, why America's first colonial rebels burned Jamestown to the ground, okay? That's the history.com, the official website of the History Channel. Now, if we look at page 40, and, we, and th these are all slides that we actually use in the class that I created, okay? Ancient Kemet, one that originates for Egypt, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. You never see a, a class like this. Uh, you probably haven't seen a class like this before, okay? Um, so when we look at um, page 40, of chapter two of Before the May Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr. Now, this is from the sixth edition, the sixth edition. Lerone Bennett Jr. is laying out this history and he talks about the fact that for all practical purposes, he says of all the improbable aspects of this situation, he's talking about in the early 1600s, okay? Of all the improbable aspects of this situation, the oddest, O-D-D-E-S-T, the oddest, to modern blacks and whites is that white people did not seem to know that they were white. It appears from surviving evidence that the first white colonists had no concept of themselves as white people, white as we think of it today with the, some of them, not all of them, but some of them having a superiority complex, about 74 million that voted for Donald Trump in 2020, okay? The legal documents identified whites as Englishmen uh, and or Christians. Okay, so this is before about 1681 in the colony of Virginia. And the term uh, who we would call white people were identified in legal documents as Englishmen or Christians. Okay, early on in the early 1600s. The word white with its burden of arrogance and biological pride developed late in the century, late in the 17th century, late in the 1600s, as a direct result of slavery and the organized debasement of blacks. But that's that's gonna be after Begin's Rebellion of 1675 and 1676. The same point can be made from the other side of the line, talking about African people. For a long time in colonial America, there was no legal name to focus white anxiety. The first blacks or Africans were called blackamores, moors, nagers, N-E-G-E-R-S, and nagars, N-E-G-A-R-S. The word negro, which is a Spanish and Portuguese term meaning black or a black thing, 
did not come into general use in Virginia until the latter part of the century, the latter part of the 17th century, the late 1600s, after Bacon's Rebellion, when they're put, putting together this form, this, this when they're formalizing white supremacy and they're instituting racism through the laws and, and uh, showing a distinction in what they will call racist by how they are treated. So what's the end result of this history, right? If we look at how Bacon's rebellion planted the seeds of race-based slavery, and this is from the this is the article from history.com, official website of the History Channel. It says in the aftermath of the rebellion, in the aftermath of Bacon's rebellion, white planters reacted with alarm to the anger they had seen among the black Virginians who had joined Nathaniel Bacon's rebellion. Quote, the planters, the planters had not been able to control this rowdy labor force of servants and slaves, end quote, historian Ira Berlin told PBS.org, public broadcast assistant, PBS.org, because they have information that I researched there as well on Bacon's rebellion. This is what I presented when when I, when I spoke at the uh, at the uh, virtual conference, Midwest decarbonization, uh, their, their their virtual conference, and they were dealing with uh, uh, environmental concerns, environmental racism, things like this. This was November, uh, twenty twenty two. I blew everybody away with my presentation. Right, quote. But soon after Bacon's rebellion, they increasingly distinguish between people of African descent and people of European descent. They enact laws which say that people of African descent are hereditary slaves, hereditary slaves. This is chattel slavery. You're enslaved for perpetuity. Ain't something you were done. You were just, it's not something you did. You were just born the wrong race. You were born the wrong color. Now, planters feared what their white indentured servants could do. So they slowly eliminated the system of white indentured servitude relying instead on enslaved African people to work their plantations because there was a declining amount of people willing to come to this country to be indentured servants because around 1680 or so, the economy in England improves, okay? So you have these different forces that the ruling class in the colonies are trying to uh, deal with. At the same time, they're dealing with Native American rebellions as well. All right. Now, um, backlash from Bacon's rebellion is credited with helping kick off the racial distinctions that defined the colonies and the United States that followed. Now, most Americans have not don't know anything about Bacon's rebellion. They think it's about bacon that you eat or something, you know, grits and bacon, uh, bacon and eggs or something. No, this helps shape racism in America and racist policies in America that we're still feeling the effect of to this day. Read this article uh, from history.com, official website of the History Channel, why America's first colonial rebels burned down, burned Jamestown, Virginia to the ground. How many people knew this? And this is what these anti- these uh, anti-black, anti-African-American history laws are doing in these various states, Florida, Georgia, Oklahoma, where you had the Tulsa race massacre, June 1st, 1921. They're designed to suppress this type of history because if you don't understand the history of how you got into a predicament or how a problem started, you're not going to be able to solve it. A people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. OK, so if you like this type of information, we have a, uh, a number of people watching on Facebook and YouTube. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like. You can register for this online course right now. You can start watching right now. We have archive content. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. You don't have to join us in the classes live. I don't take attendance. And also you can see me. I can't see you. So you don't have to get dressed for class and things like that. OK, we have a live text chat so you can ask questions in class. You can email me afterwards if you, if you want to ask questions. Also, uh, Saturdays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. I teach ancient Kemet, one of the original 
original names for Egypt, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. The Ma'afa is a key Swahili term, which means the great disaster, our Holocaust, or the transatlantic slave trade. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Um, you can register for this class right now. You can use this with your children. I would say the content is PG-13. And then uh, on Sundays, I teach Black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement, 1800 to 1968. And I was teaching this class. I first started teaching this class in 2021. Okay, I created this class as well. Uh, the second one, because I had so much information in the first class that I, I, I knew that this period from 1800 leading up to the Civil War, what causes the Civil War to take place, the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, Missouri Compromise of 1820, uh, Tex uh, Mexico winning its independence from Spain, 1821, uh, Vicente Guerrero becoming president of Mexico, second president of Mexico, he was of African descent, um, 1829, Texas winning its independence from Mexico, 1836, uh, Mexican-American War, 1846-1848, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, which ends the Mexican-American War. And as a result of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the U.S. gets the territory from Mexico that makes up California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, and Nevada. You have the Compromise of 1850, which uh, deals with organizing the land that the U.S. gets from Mexico. Uh, and Texas, come, uh, uh, California comes into the Union in 1850 as a free state, but they do try to ban all free African Americans under their first governor, Peter Burnett, by the way. They tried to ban all free African Americans. It didn't work. But the fifth uh, bill in the Compromise of 1850 was the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. OK, which went farther than the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793. And we know the U.S. Constitution sanctioned slavery in Article 4, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution laid the foundation for the Fugitive Slave Act. So this is why it's important to read the U.S. Constitution. So I hear all these people talking about we want reparations, we want reparations. And if you're seeking a legal remedy to a historical problem, that would imply to me that you need to understand both law and history. Unfortunately, most of our people, especially a lot of people saying we want reparations, don't understand either one. And the foundation of law in this country is the U.S. Constitution. You need to read the U.S. Constitution. Also study the treaties as well, like the Black Freedmen Indian Treaties of 1866. And I talked about the Black Freedmen Indian Treaties in um, when I spoke um, at the conference. OK, and, and what I found very interesting. Is that. The Native American, so there's about seven of us on the panel. It's a virtual panel. It's about, I think, three Native Americans, one person who was African American and Native American. And I could be classified as that too, because I had Cherokee on my mother's side, <laughs> Cherokee and Blackfoot, because my parents, my mother's family's from Tennessee. But um, and then you had about three or four African Americans, right? Native Americans were talking about getting treaties enforced. African Americans were talking about getting a study done. They were talking, they were, they were talking about HR 40. And my thing is like, why the hell are we trying to focus on a study? Now, this was before California came out with their final came out with their uh their final study, which is a thousand pages. Everybody needs to go read the executive summary and read and read it. And they put forth at least 110 policy recommendations to repair the damage of even though California does not have a deep history of slavery, like say Texas, because uh, um, 1850, California, uh, between 1850, 1860, California has maybe about 1500 people who are in a, 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 a semi-slavery status, where 1865, when Major General Gordon Granger goes into Galveston, Texas, in June of 1865, Texas has 250,000 enslaved Africans. So California doesn't have a deep history of slavery like Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama, Texas, anything like that. OK, but they do have a rapid history of racism, discrimination, housing discrimination, redlining, voter suppression, things of this nature. OK, but I talked about the Black Freedmen Indian Treaties of 1866. And the reason why I discussed this is because. We have a history, our ancestors, of getting benefits from these treaties. And the reason why is because 
the uh, 1830 president, okay, I'm trying, I'm really trying to wrap this discussion up. I know it may not seem like it, but I, I'm really trying to wrap this discussion up. But let, let me just try to, <laughs> let me just try to uh, wrap it up with this here. So 1830, President Andrew Jackson, Donald Trump's favorite president, one white supremacist who loves another white supremacist. Andrew Jackson signs the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which pushes the Choctaw, Ch Chickasaw Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians off their land in southeastern United States. And they go over a thousand miles out west into Oklahoma, or what's known as the Trail of Tears. Okay. Now, these are what's known what Europeans call the five civilized tribes of Native Americans. All right. All five of these Native American nations all own African slaves, and Cherokee, the Cherokee own the most. OK, and I have Cherokee in my family. So there's a, there's a history of this. Right. So there's an article from The New York Times, September 8th, 2020. Black Native American and fighting for recognition in Indian country. Enslaved African people were also driven west along the Trail of Tears, the 1830s, after a historic Supreme Court ruling. Uh, their descendants are finding to be counted as tribal members. So. About a third of the people who were on the Trail of Tears were African people, okay? Slaves of the uh, five civilized tribes of Native America. Some people wanted to call them servants. If you, that, that makes you feel better and helps you sleep at night, okay, you can call them servants. Yes, they're um, Africans who entered, married into the, uh, yes, you had people who were part African American, part Native American, that's true. Yes. African people were the original people here. And uh, when Asians come about 3000 BC or, or something like that, they come over here across the Bering Straits. The Africans and Asians intermix and their offspring are called Native Americans. That's true as well. Dr. David M. Hotel deals with this in his book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence, um, which I have here somewhere in the office because um, we deal with we reference this book in the class. That, all, all that's true. OK. Different things happen at different times. OK, so just because African people were already here or some of us were already here does not mean the transatlantic slave trade did not take place. And just because the transatlantic slave trade took place does not mean that African people were not already here. You have to understand a chronology of the last 50,000 years of history. OK, but this is another conversation. Um, Ron, let me see. Where are we here? OK, Ron Graham's ancestor. So in this article, they talk about this uh, man of African descent named Ron Graham. Ron Graham's ancestors are known as Creek Freedmen. They were among the thousands of African-Americans who were once enslaved by tribal members in the South and who migrated to Oklahoma when the when the Native American tribes were forced off their homelands and marched west in the 1830s. This ties into the origins of what we call Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, okay? And in and, and, and one of the first history lessons I got on this was um, Hannibal B. Johnson's book, this one here, Hannibal B. Johnson's book, uh, Black Wall Street from Riot to Renaissance in Tulsa's historic Greenwood District, this book right here, one of the best books that you read dealing with the real history of Black Wall Street. This is one of the first historical books to really deal with this. And this, uh, he had, uh, this was like the second edition, I think. This came out in, um, I think it was 2001 or something like this. Uh, 1998, okay, 1998, all right? This is one of the first books that dealt with the real history of uh black wall street and the origins of tulsa oklahoma so hannibal b johnson is one of the top scholars on this history uh with facebook friends as well we've talked through facebook i need to get them on the african history network show all right now um so so the 1830s now tulsa oklahoma was founded by creek indians around 1834 who got pushed off their land in southeastern united states Tulsa comes from the Creek Indian word Talasi. And the Creek Native Americans, they take their African slaves into Oklahoma. Now, in treaties signed after, so uh, one of the things we talked about on the panel discussion was how can we lift up both movements, the Native American movement, and this, uh, what is it called? It's uh, 
return the land or uh, it's their movement to get back the, the freedom land movement. It's the movement for Native Americans to get their land back from the U.S. government. How can we lift up both movements and create synergies? Now, in treaties signed after the Civil War, this is why it's important to understand the Civil War, okay? 1861, April 12, 1861, it starts in South Carolina with the attack on uh, Fort Sumter, which was a military stronghold. It ends, well, Major um, General Robert E. Lee surrenders to Ulysses S. Grant April 9th, 1865 at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia, but it does not come to an official end until August, 1860, uh, August 1866, because even though General Robert E. Lee surrendered and his, and his uh, army was the largest Confederate army, it was not the only confederate army you had uh general joseph e johnston of tennessee he he had a confederate army as well you had nathan bedford forrest that clansman that that clan he go nathan bedford forrest goes on to be the first grand wizard of the ku klux klan in 1867 okay um you get into the port Pillow, uh port uh the fort pillow massacre led by nathan bedford forrest all this you got about 200 uh african-american soldiers who were executed uh at the fort pillow massacre so this is a deep history here OK, now in treaties signed after the Civil War, 1861, 1865, uh, they won freedom and were promised tribal citizenship and an equal stake in the Native American tribes, lands and fortunes. They're talking about African-Americans who we call black freedmen, freedmen, black freedmen, former slaves or ex-slaves. OK, after slavery ended, they didn't keep calling themselves slaves, which why doesn't make sense for some african-americans today to call themselves descendants of slaves because after slavery ended they stopped calling themselves slaves and when their children were born they didn't call their children descendants of slaves african people took up arms and if you understand the history of the civil war you had about two hundred thousand african-american men including harriet tubman who was a woman who fought in the Civil War, took up arms to fight for their freedom and the freedom of their children and future generations. So why would we put our ancestors back into a condition that they took up arms to fight to free themselves from? If you want to say you're descended of former slaves, okay. Not sure why you would define yourself as that because African people were here tens of thousands of years before slavery ended, uh, before slavery ended. But okay, if you want to call yourself a descendant of ex slaves, descendant of black freedmen, okay. But why would we try to, why would we identify with a condition that our ancestors took up arms to fight to free themselves from? As a historian, that doesn't make any sense to me. But OK, that's what you want to do um, now. In treaty signed after the Civil War, they won freedom. They were promised tribal citizenship and an equal stake in the tribe's lands and fortunes. But what followed were broken promises, exclusions and painful fights over whether tens of thousands of their descendants should now be recognized as tribal members because our ancestors who were in these treaties got land from these treaties. This is how you get a Sarah Rector. Sarah Rector, who was, uh, uh, parents were owned by Muskogee Creek, okay? She becomes the richest Afro-American girl in the country because oil is discovered on her land in Oklahoma. And they get land from the Dawes Allotment Act of 1887 and the uh, Black Freeman Indian treaties. Now, these treaties, now what happens is about 1941, the U.S. government conspires with the five civilized tribes of Native Americans to redefine what a Native American is. And they said that you had to have one, qu one quarter or one quantum Native American blood. So many of our ancestors get pushed out of these treaties and their land is taken away. But these treaties are still on the books right now. Now, Dr. Claude Anderson, one of my teachers who we've had on the African History Network show years before, a lot of these other people found out about them. OK, we had Dr. Claude Anderson on years ago. Um, he was fighting for years to get these treaties enforced for black people. But now attorney Demario Solomon Simmons out of Oklahoma, out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, who is descendant of Muscogee Creek, African-Americans, of black freedmen. He has taken up this fight and he's, he's an attorney. 
sometimes we're on Roland Martin and Filtered together. Because some of you all see me on Roland Martin and Filtered. I've been on Roland Show. It'll be three years, uh, October 2023, that I've been a panelist every Friday on Roland Martin and Filtered. Uh, and, my, and what I was saying on the panel is why we focus on the study, we, we need to be focused on getting these treaties enforced. Because when you read the article from the New York Times, there's about 160,000 African-Americans who, who would qualify for these treaties and qualify for these benefits and get land, free college tuition, free taxes, all different, whatever benefits the uh, Native Americans are getting. Now, some of the descendants have won lawsuits seeking inclusion in the Cherokee Nation. Some gained, some gained nominal citizenship as Seminole, Seminole Indians, but said they could not access tribal services. Others like Ron Graham have nothing. Read this full article from uh, the New York Times. But now a landmark Supreme Court decision for tribal sovereignty has breathed uh, new life into their fight. In July 2020, the Supreme Court recognized a huge portion of eastern Oklahoma as reservation land under the terms of an 1866 treaty. The same treaty also guaranteed that freed slaves and their descendants would, quote, have and enjoy all the rights and privileges of native citizens, end quote. So my thing is like, while we focus on trying to get a study done that has no benefits attached to it, the first thing we should do is focus on getting these treaties enforced because these are laws on the books right now. But if you don't understand history of law, you don't know this exists. You go out here trying to get HR 40 done. And nobody has told me how they're going to get HR 40 passed in the Senate, because once it passes the House of Representatives with 218 votes, you need 60 votes in the Senate. So if you have 51 Democrats, that means you need nine Republicans that are going to vote for H.R. 40. Repub no Republicans support reparations, not even the black ones. Senator Tim Scott, who blocked the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act when the talks fell apart in uh, September, uh, I think it was September 2021. OK. Senator Tim Scott has gone on record saying he doesn't support reparations. So he's not going to vote for it. If the black Republican doesn't vote for reparations, how many white Republicans you think going to vote for it? Byron Donald's out of Florida. That Negro, he doesn't support reparations. Uh, Burgess Owens out of Utah. He doesn't support reparations. John James out of Michigan. He doesn't support reparations. So if black Republicans don't support reparations, how many white Republicans you think going to do it? This is why voting matters. This is why these people who keep voting against our own interests have to be voted out of office. We have to fire them. Elections have consequences. Uh, okay, so uh, to wrap this discussion up, um, now, to groups of their descendants, the logic was simple. If the United States still had to honor treaty promises it made to tribal nations, then tribal nations had to keep their word to the descendants of those formerly enslaved by the tribes. Quote, we're making noise, in quotes, said Marilyn, in quotes, said Marilyn Van, V-A-N-N, -N, a Cherokee citizen and president of the descendants of freedmen of the five civilized tribes. Marilyn Van estimated that there were that, that there was a diaspora of some 160,000 descendants of those formerly enslaved by these Native American tribes. These five. Now, there are, five, there are approximately 567 Native American nations in this country. I am not saying that all Native American nations enslaved African people. That is not what I'm saying. And the history does not prove that. The history does not show that. The, the five civilized tribes, what we'll call the five civilized tribes, they did they did the bulk of that. OK, so I just, so sometimes uh, I get responses from Native Americans, things like that. I, the, the, I'm not saying all 566 tribal nations own African slaves. That's not what I'm saying at all. OK, I'm being very specific with what I'm talking about. And you can read this information as well. Proper documentation ends all conversation. All right. Now, um. Marilyn Van estimated uh, some 160,000 of these uh, of those formerly enslaved by the tribes, many of them living in Oklahoma. Now, there are groups representing descendants from 
uh, each of the five tribes who meet to share uh, sepia photographs uh, of ancestors, compare genealogical records, and plan protests, okay? Now, as they file lawsuits in federal and tribal courts, they say they are fighting for tribal benefits, including access to jobs, health care at tribal clinics and hospitals, housing, scholarship funds for their children, and the right to vote in tribal elections, but also for something more fundamental, quote, my identity, end quote, uh, uh, Mr. Graham said. Now, uh, read this article here from the Washington Post, Black Native American and fighting for recognition in Indian country, Black Native American and fighting for recognition in Indian country. This is from September 8th, 2020 from the Washington Post. The article goes on to say the freedmen were granted tribal citizenship and in some cases, quote, an equal interest in the soil and national funds, end quote, of, the, of that Native American tribe. In the treaties that Oklahoma's tribes signed with the federal government after the Civil War, in which the tribes were forced to cede huge portions of their land to the U.S. government. Okay, now we know Maxine Waters um, was is, has been working with uh, Demario Solomon Simmons, uh, trying to get legislation pushed on this as well. And there's an article from History.com, official website of the History Channel, once again, called Nine Entrepreneurs Who Helped Build Tulsa's Black Wall Street. OK, and you have to see you have to understand this chronology of history, the origins of Tulsa, Oklahoma. So you have all these people out here. They're trying to recreate what Tulsa did. Black Wall Street, this Wall Street, that almost none of them are talking about getting these treaties enforced. And here's why this is important. OK, now Hannibal B. Johnson is cited in this article from um, uh, History dot com. OK. Hannibal B. Johnson said the relative wealth of some black folks in Oklahoma comes in part, comes in part through their connection to the tribes and their land ownership, through the connection to these Native American nations and these treaties, okay? Says Hannibal B. Johnson, historian and author of Black Wall Street 100, an American city grapples with its uh, historical racial trauma, all right? Now this was, um, the book that he wrote that came out uh, on the centennial commemoration in 2021 of the Tulsa race massacre that was June 1st, 1921, started June 1st, 1921. Hannibal B. Johnson went on to say, the Dawes Act of 1887 that I mentioned a few minutes ago, the Dawes Allotment Act of 1887, which redistributed 138 million, 138 million acres of land, uh, in, in, in the majority of us was, was supposed to go to Native Americans and black Indians, but white people ended up getting two thirds of that land. This is where the phrase $5 Indian comes from because they found out that this land, white people found out this land was give, being given away. And it was like a census that was taken. So you had people that had to go around uh, through Native American country and document who was there, African-Americans that were there so that land could be distributed. But they had to anglicize their name. They had to anglicize their name. So Christianize their name, take on, you know, white names, John Smith, something like that. So white people found out about this. So they paid five dollars to the registrars to have their name added to the Dawes Road so they can get some of that land. OK, so white people end up getting two thirds of this land. Britannica.com has information on the Dawes, D-A-W-E-S, named after Senator Henry L. Dawes of Massachusetts. That's who this. Uh, law was named after. Britannica.com has information on the Dawes Act of 1887. You can check that out. Now, the Dawes Act of 1887 authorized the government to, to divide tribal territories into allotments for individual Native Americans, which included Black members, which included Black members. As word spread, the Indian Territory was a safe place for African Americans to settle between 1865 and 1920. More than 50 black townships were founded in Oklahoma. All right. So a lot of the early African American landowners in Tulsa, Oklahoma, got land from the Black Freeman Indian Treaties of 1866. 
and Tulsa, Oklahoma was founded by Creek Indians, Creek Indians right around 1834 when they go into Oklahoma after being pushed off their land in Southeast United States and they take their African slaves with them into Oklahoma and Tulsa comes from the Creek Indian word Talasi. So when you study this history, then you see how we got to where we are today and how the laws and policies of, of the past are shaping the conditions of the day. So it was laws and policies that put us in this predicament. It's going to be laws and policies that get us out of this predicament. All right. Uh, so visit my website, uh, the African history network.com, the African history network.com. How you all like this type of information? Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like. Um, also, I have in digital download format and DVD format, um, 15 of my lectures in a bundle pack. African History Awakens the African Mind from Mental Death. Uh, this is a 15 lecture uh, bundle pack. Uh, the, the digital download is $75. In DVD form, it's $100. Okay. It's right on the homepage of our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. And uh, also, we have our PayPal Cash App information here as well. Um, this is our Cash App account, dollar sign, the HN Show, S H O W. These other ones are fake African History Network cash apps. There's about five I've identified. I'm trying to get them shut down. You click right here, it takes you to our, our Q, this is our QR code for Cash App. Um, and when you go to it, it'll say Michael. Make sure my picture there as well. Here's our PayPal information, dollar sign, the AHN show um, through PayPal. So you can register for the online. This is my DVD lectures, digital downloads. They're at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Also, listen to the African History Network show Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on our social media platforms. Uh, 9, 10, 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, WFDF, the radio station I was on. They did a format change. Uh, so they, they don't, it's not talk radio anymore. It's fine with me. I have my own network, so it really don't make me any difference. Uh, and our shows are in audio podcast uh, format as well. Okay, so uh, hopefully you hopefully you learned a lot from the discussion today with Dr. Chike Akua and our discussion um, afterwards. Support the African History Network it takes a lot to produce these shows, do the research, uh, pay the bills, keep the network going. Uh, we're going to get out of here. Remember, right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And we'll talk to you next time. Peace.